All right, thanks very much. Uh, we'll get started here. So today I'm going to be talking about listeria, uh, some of the characteristics, the contamination, uh, and some of the patterns that, that might, you might see, and how to control it. Um, so a lot of the topics that I'm going to cover today, uh, it's, it's sort of an overview of listeria. And so each of these um, topics uh, could really be their own sort of hour-long webinar. Uh, so if you want to learn more about something, uh, a good way to do that is to sort of investigate on our, on our website. We have the, the nationwide one for our Integrated Food Safety Centers of Excellence, and then you can also go to the New York-specific one, so we sort of cover the Northeast region and sort of try to serve as a resource to the, the states in our region and then nationwide as well on, on a few different things, uh, one of which is environmental sampling, uh, which sort of relates to Listeria today. So you can actually find some different webinars, other resources uh, to learn more. Uh, I also want to let you know that we actually just uh, developed some quick train videos. So these are short five to 10 minute videos. Uh, that are supposed to really help you review how to sample right before you're going into sampling. So if you're ever about to sample uh, a food facility and let's say you're like sitting in the parking lot and you're trying to remember what you're, you're supposed to be doing, uh, we've got these videos available. They're not on our website yet, but they are on YouTube, so you can check that out. And we also have a Listeria cheat sheet coming out uh, that sort of has everything you need to know related to Listeria and food. And so that'll be put on our website as well as in several different languages. So keep an eye out for that or send us an email if you, if you want to see that. Uh, and today's webinar is being recorded and that will also be posted. So today I'm going to go over the Listeria basics, uh, how to minimize Listeria contamination, and then talk about what's really required and Listeria control verification. So we're starting with Listeria basics. So listeria is a bacterial environmental pathogen and it's usually foodborne. So usually people who get sick from listeria who develop listeriosis, it's usually from a food source. Uh, it's found in the soil, it's found in the natural environment actually. You might see it on, find it on a sidewalk or in an ATM machine, uh, but it's found in the soil. And so that's very different from other pathogens like E. coli and salmonella, which are primarily associated with animals and fecal contamination. They're invisible, uh, very, they're uh, small that you can't see them with the naked eye. There's no or odor, uh, so you can't really look around your facility and say, oh, that's, that's listeria, that's uh, where we're going to find it. The, the only real method of detecting it is by microbiological testing. It's very hardy. Uh, it can grow at refrigeration temperatures, uh, but uh, refrigeration is actually still considered a good way to control listeria because it does slow down the growth uh, considerably. But listeria is different than other foodborne pathogens in that it can still grow even if it's slower rates uh, at refrigeration temperatures. So this becomes a problem if you, let's say you've got a uh, cantaloupe or some soft cheese and that's got a little bit of contamination on the food, but if you put it in your fridge for a week, then then uh, that's when it starts to become a problem because listeria can grow in your refrigerator over that, that time period and become a problem, become uh, a lethal dose. It can also survive stressful conditions and it can persist. So listeria is known to survive uh, weeks, months, and even years in food facilities, continuing, continually growing and recontaminating food. It likes wet environments, so I'll talk a little bit more about that later and it's commonly associated with ready-to-eat food. Uh, and I want to remind everyone that listeria is heat sensitive. So if you cook your food, the listeria will die. Uh, we sort of talk so much about listeria that it almost feels like the superbug that can survive anything. But really, it's associated with ready-to-eat foods because uh, ready-to-eat foods aren't heated, aren't cooked. So um, it is heat sensitive. So when I'm talking about listeria, that's the genus. And if I'm talking about Listeria monocytogenes, that's the species, monocytogenes is the species, and that's the pathogen uh, of the Listeria genus. Uh, you might also hear people talk about Listeria species as a group. So that includes all of the species, for example, Listeria inocula. And so other species within this genus are not pathogenic. Uh, it's only Listeria monocytogenes that's gonna make you sick. Uh, 
Uh, however, when you're doing testing in a food facility or in food, you might test, uh, or yeah, just in the environment, you wouldn't test food for listeria species. But in the environment, it's more conservative to test for listeria species because chances are, even if a non pathogenic uh, species of the listeria genus can grow and survive in a, in a place in your environment, then so can listeria monocytogenes. So what happens if you get sick from listeria? So most of us are healthy individuals, and so we won't suffer anything more than mild gastroenteritis. Uh, however, for susceptible individuals, such as pregnant women, immunocompromised, or elderly individuals, uh, they might experience a more severe infection called listeriosis, and that's where listeria gets into the bloodstream and makes you very sick. So if we compare listeria to some other uh, foodborne pathogens that you might be familiar with, I've got the top five pathogens that contribute to uh, foodborne illness resulting in death here in the United States. Salmonella is actually number one. It causes 378 deaths. Toxoplasma gondii, so that's the parasite that uh, is the reason why pregnant women aren't supposed to change the litter box. And listeria is actually number three. It causes 255 deaths uh, in the U.S. each year. Norovirus comes in at number four and Campylobacter at number five. Now, when we look at the top five pathogens that contribute to domestically acquired foodborne illness, we've got norovirus at five and a half million, salmonella at about a million, and clostridium, Campylobacter, and Staphylococcus aureus uh, round out the top five. But what I want to point out to you is that listeria actually doesn't make the top five list for pathogens that contribute to domestically acquired foodborne illness. And that's because listeria only causes about 1,600 cases of foodborne illness in the U.S. each year. Uh, so what that means is, is that it has a very high case fatality rate, because if you think about it, it causes 1,600 illnesses, but 255 deaths which means that if listeria gets into your bloodstream and causes listeriosis, then you have about a one in five chance of dying. So we have to think about that in terms of outbreaks. You might have a norovirus outbreak or a salmonella outbreak that could be hundreds of cases and nobody will die. Whereas a listeria outbreak, uh, if, if you have as many as, you know, as few as five cases, then you're already starting to see deaths. And that's a huge problem not just for public health, but for, for food facilities as well, because that's, that's a huge concern. So when we're talking about uh, where listeria is, I sort of wanna zoom out for a second. Uh, this is results from a sampling project that our lab did pretty recently, where we collected soil samples across the United States uh, from state and national parks to try to figure out where listeria might be in the United States. And so out of a thousand soil samples collected across the continental US, about 300 of them were positive for listeria. And 10% uh, were positive for listeria monocytogenes. So I talked earlier about listeria species versus monocytogenes. So about 10% were pa positive for pathogenic listeria monocytogenes. Um, so here we've got the, the distribution of listeria by state. And I put this on here because a lot of you are calling in from Maryland. And if you look over here, we took 10 uh, soil samples from the state of Maryland, and seven of them were positive for listeria. So that sort of gives you an idea of where uh, listeria lies in the US. And you can see some of the states have better off. Nevada, for example, uh, Arizona, it doesn't seem like listeria really grows that well in the environment, of, in those environments. But that doesn't mean that it's not gonna to get into their food facilities. And once it gets into a food facility, that's where it can really thrive, proliferate, and contaminate food. So even though there are some states that have less listeria in the natural environment, it doesn't mean that those food facilities in those states are immune. But you can see here uh, in the Northeast, we just sort of have it, uh, we sort of have, we're at a disadvantage from the start. So when you're thinking about employees walking into food facilities from the street, you might want to start thinking about, you know, what they could be tracking in. So in terms of uh, what listeria has looked like or listeriosis has looked like uh, over the last few years, I've got a graph here that shows that the incidence has actually gone down over time. 
Uh, so you can see here that it's actually plateaued in the last 20 years or so and, and sort of stuck to be the same, this orange line here. But in blue, you can see the number of solved outbreaks. So as our public health agencies get better and technologies uh, develop, you can see that they're actually, despite there being a plateau in the incidence of listeria, there's been a rapid uh, increase in the number of outbreaks that they've been able to solve. The other thing that I wanna highlight about this graph is that it used to be that we needed about 70 cases uh, in order to, to detect an outbreak and then solve it. Uh, and now with whole genome sequencing, uh, you really only need a couple of cases for an outbreak to even be detected. Uh, and, and, but we, we need to be able to solve them at that, small, at that small case size as well. So what this all means is, is that we're gonna have less epidemiological information just because we have fewer cases because we're detecting outbreaks much sooner than we used to. And as a result, that gives us a lack of statistical power. So the epi information is still critical, but it also means we need to consider all data. Does the epi data match the environmental health data? And does that, do both of those match the lab data? So identifying a food source increasingly relies on these trace back and trace forward investigations and oftentimes environmental sampling.